Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kirsten Gelsdorf. Um, I'm a professor at the Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy at the University of Virginia. Um, and before that, I worked for the United Nations for um, almost two decades, first doing global humanitarian crisis response, and then also working um, as the chief of policy analysis for the humanitarian organization. So I decided um, I wanted to start uh, today by showing you um, two images. So this first image is, some of you may have seen the New York Times article um, where uh, you know, wash our hands, some people can't wash their kids. And this is a paraphrased quote um, that was taken from somebody named Fadi Messahir, who is the director of the Maram Foundation for Relief and Development um, in Idlib. And Idlib is in Northwestern Syria where basically a million people have had to flee the civil war. And many of them, as you can see here in this photo, are kind of sheltering in these kinds of tents or in abandoned buildings. And what we know is that there's around 12 people per tent. Um, there's no running water. Um, most of the floors are, are muddy. Um, and you know, daily, these individuals need to go out and find food. And so this is kind of a glimpse of um, what I want you to think about in terms of thinking about you know, prevention and response um, during COVID. The second image I want to show you is a little bit different, um, which is uh, a lot of my former colleagues um, at the United Nations are now kind of posting just like this from around New York. And this is a basically a temporary field hospital that's being set up um, in Central Park um, by the same organizations that we often uh, find in post-crisis scenarios and um, after the Haiti earthquake and the tsunami. And here we have, um, this is an image of the United Nations basically giving masks um, to the mayor of New York. So I wanted to um, show and kind of start by showing you these images um, because what I'm hoping to do today is kind of talk on two, on two parallel paths, right? The first is, um, to explain the massive need that we see among some of the world's most vulnerable who are already caught in crisis. But the second is also, you know, while some of what I am gonna present maybe feels overwhelming, I wanna offer kind of some of the bright spots of unity and solidarity and humanity that we're already seeing kind of unfolding um, in this crisis as well. So let me start by giving you a little bit about um, the humanitarian situation. So, you know, most of the media attention that you're seeing um, is probably really focused on the US and Europe. Um, but what we really need to quickly, I think, start to realize and to respond to is as Robert Muga recently said, right, this, is, this crisis has a totalizing effect, which means every country, every city, every neighborhood is probably gonna be impacted in some way, shape or form. And that um, some of the humanitarian policy experts really think that the most severe impacts of the virus is yet to, is yet to be felt. So what do I mean by that? Well, I kind of, I gave you, um, you know, kind of a glimpse on Syria um, and that there's 1 million people kind of in the Northwest, but there's actually 168 million people that the United Nations now estimates that are also still living in conflict and natural disaster situations. And while we hear about like Syria or Yemen, these people are actually kind of placed throughout um, 50 different countries. So it's not like we can just kind of focus on one or two. It's really humanitarian crisis is really um, a global, a global uh, situation that we're working on. And while we hear these phrases like the virus doesn't discriminate, um, what we do know is that it is gonna disproportionately affect some populations. So how does that look? Well, what I thought what I would do is kind of tell you a couple of the things that, you know, we're hearing and then how do, how do the things that we're hearing kind of map onto these humanitarian crises? So the first one, right, social distancing, staying at home. Well, this is almost impossible in most crisis contexts. So I showed you the picture of Idlib, right? It's like 12 to a tent. Um, but there's also much larger camps, like there's Cox's Bazaar, which is where the Rohingya refugees are located in Bangladesh. You know, it's estimated there are about a million people. It's really rolling, hilly territory. It's incredibly congested. One estimate is that there's around 90,000 people to a square kilometer. So what we see is like a massive congestion of, of people um, 
outside of camps, you know, we know that today around 70% of the world's um, refugees and displaced populations are actually in urban areas. And most of those are also kind of in overcrowded urban slum settings. But even if you were to be um, someone caught in crisis who was able to somehow kind of maybe uh, social distance or isolate yourselves with your family, um, the reality is that for most of these people, right, they need to go out every day to basically get food and get water. And so, you know, we are seeing quotes kind of in humanitarian news articles right now where people are saying like, look, my choice is really between, you know, going out or um, going out and you know, exposing myself to COVID or starving. And so this is kind of the hard decisions that are there. Okay, washing your hands is the second thing we hear a lot about. So of course we think, you know, 20 seconds, those types of issues. Well, in most humanitarian crisis settings, right, water and sanitation can be a huge challenge. So we know there's around 3 billion people globally that currently lack hand washing facilities, right? So that's 40% of the world's population. That's kind of where we're starting right now in terms of thinking about the things that we need to do. So surveillance and testing. So we're hearing in the news a lot about how challenging it is to get um, testing. Well, of course, uh, in the US and in Europe, well, you know, uh, that is that challenge is only exacerbated in many of these crisis contexts. contexts. So for example, uh, it's estimated by the World Health Organization that don't World, World Health Organization, sorry, that only 50% of countries actually have kind of a clinical referral system or a national infection and prevention control programs. And so many of those are these crisis contexts. But even if you did somehow, you know, you were able to kind of um, do some surveillance, um, you know, there's the context that we're facing, for example, as we know from when we responded to Ebola, is that, you know, many populations are also, you know, distrusting of their governments because they're just coming out of basically a decade of conflict or crisis, right? So we have those issues to contend with as well. So PPEs, right, personal um, protection equipment, also a major challenge in humanitarian settings, but it's not just about PPEs. The majority of these crisis contexts rely on a really sophisticated network of logistics, right? So the border closures, the quarantines, the trade disruptions, market volatility, it's all gonna um, disrupt supply chains where kind of vital food, um, water, medicine, um, you know, that's used to basically sustain lives and livelihoods in these contexts is gonna get disrupted. And finally, you know, even if we were able to kind of address some of these issues of social distancing, hand washing, detection, surveillance, PPE, what does healthcare look like? So we know that in most um, situations of crisis and conflict, right, they already suffer from pretty extremely degraded or broken healthcare systems. As an example, so, you know, in the Idlib um, example I gave you earlier, it's estimated that there's around 200 intensive care units and 59 of which are equipped with ventilators, right? In Cox's Bazaar, the camp I told you about in Bangladesh, where there's a million people, we're looking at about 300 beds that are available. Um, in Venezuela right now, um, you know, the statistics are around 70% of the hospitals report that they only have intermittent water service and 20% have almost no water. You know, they know that at least around 35,000 medics, nurses, and health personnel have already fled the country and have left, um, you know, following the crisis over the last <clears throat> couple years. And in Venezuela, they report there's an estimation that there's only around 84 intensive care beds. Well, so if you think about New York City is calling for, I think, around 100,000 beds, right? To think that the country of Venezuela has 84 and, you know, Cox's Bazaar has 300, that can kind of tell you the gravity with which kind of the humanitarian system is thinking about how it's going to respond um, in this situation. So I just gave you kind of an avalanche of um, bad news and I don't wanna kind of leave it there, um, which is why I kind of showed that that second kind of photo, right? Of what, I, what, we're, what we're also seeing is that this crisis has the chance to kind of flip a bunch of things around and for, to, for the world to kind of show a new spirit kind of innovation and global humanity. So a couple of examples. So Bethany Teachman, she's another UVA professor, um, just recently put out an article kind of talking about how, you know, um, 
when you face some of these situations and you feel threat that instead you should kind of think about how you can rise to a challenge. And I guess I would say that for many in the humanitarian aid industry, and I'm sure many others, that is kind of the mental framework that aid officials use, right? Is kind of switching from thinking of something as a threat, threat to thinking about it, how we can respond to it as a challenge. And we know in the humanitarian system that we have a lot of incredible lessons learned, right? Infrastructure that's been used to address cholera and Ebola, um, the lessons that we've learned from there are now being applied in this situation. And luckily the health sector in kind of global humanitarian response is one of the strongest sectors, right? Where we have a lot of evidence, we have a lot of innovation, we have a lot of experience. Um, it does, however, need kind of massive kind of financial support and government support to be able to work properly. We also have these incredible, um, I think people in the humanitarian space, Paul Spiegel, um, you know, yesterday hosted a really large webinar at Hopkins, you know, and they're already thinking about things like in Cox's Bazaar, what can they do? So if schools are closed, you know, can we now kind of train teachers to be public health care officials and um, public health care workers, or can we train them to help support kind of mild cases of cholera as, you know, as, as it, um, as an if and when um, it hits, it hits the camp. Um, yesterday he hosted this conference call and it was amazing as there was over 500 humanitarian aid practitioners that kind of got on that call to also think about um, lessons learned and ways of working on this. And, you know, one other exciting thing that we're seeing is um, in the International Crisis Group is looking a lot at this. In natural disasters, um, we've often seen um, these trends of kind of rival parties or warring factions actually getting together. And we're already seeing a couple of bright spots like that. So for example, the UAE and Kuwait is offering a lot of humanitarian aid to Iran. Um, the UN has called for a freezing of the fighting in Yemen, right, to basically be able to um, prepare for COVID. And so far, the Houthis, the Yemeni officials, Saudi Arabia, and other key armed actors um, have agreed and are talking about that. In Venezuela, um, we're seeing some incredible opportunities. You know, Venezuela and Colombia talked for the first time in a year um, with the support of the Pan American Health Organization. In the Philippines, the president um, has announced basically a one, a one month unilateral ceasefire to kind of um, with uh, the communist rebels there to kind of prepare for the COVID outbreak. So, you know, these are these kinds of things that we're also watching and, and um, you know, hoping maybe provide some relief in kind of humanitarian settings. And the last is there's all these little stories coming out, right? Um, so in Saxony, a part of Germany, um, where the alternative for Germany, which is really the most um, nativist uh, faction, um, who has generally had an anti-refugee and immigrant agenda, um, you know, in this region recently, there was a call for um, all um, many foreign doctors, um, medics to basically step up, and only over 300 of them have stepped up and are starting to help in this region. And so what we're seeing maybe is some of a change of public perception in there about, you know, um, acceptance of refugees and immigrants. So this is all kind of a little bit of a glimpse that I wanted to provide to get us started. Um, and I hope that it kind of gives you some context to ask some questions. So Erin, I'm ready for any of those. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Geldstorf, for joining us today. Um, and we welcome questions submitted um, by our viewers on Facebook. Thank you to all of our audience members who are tuning in. If you um, want to comment with your questions, I know we already have a couple. I will make sure that um, those get to Professor Gelsdorf. So first, we have a question um, from Olivia who says, thank you for doing this. Can you give us some examples of humanitarian situations around the world that concern you? Yeah, thanks, Olivia. Um, well, I am really concerned, as I think many humanitarian aid professionals are, about places like Cox's Bazaar, these kind of increasingly congested areas, right? Um, maybe, Olivia, I can show you one other um, graphic that'll kind of give you a sense um, of the scale of the situation. One second. Let me just pull that up again in a second. There we go. Okay. So the International Rescue Committee, which is one of um, one of the um, 
um, humanitarian international um, NGOs has basically recently um, put out this graphic. Um, you know, this kind of shows on the Diamond Princess cruise ship, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, right? There were, there were around 24 people per 1,000 square meters. And because of that congestion, we realized that um, the disease spread four times faster, right, on the ship. Well, if you then look at what Cox's Bazaar looks like, right, we're estimating almost double that, 40 people per 1,000 square meters. So it's this kind of congestion that I think that we're thinking about um, will make it a much harder situation. And here's another one, right, the Moria camp in Greece. So it's these kind of, um, these kind of situations that we're thinking about, we know from kind of cholera um, and other epidemics that we need to take really seriously how we how we support them. But in Cox's Bazaar, it's not just about congestion, right? There's also really high levels of malnutrition. And we are thinking that that's still going to be a major challenge for uh, many people will increase vulnerability, but we're still, we don't actually know 100% the effects between malnutrition and COVID as far as I'm aware. And one of the latest things that's happened, you know, the government recently has put a ban on internet and mobile phones. And so, of course, that means many things, but what it also means is it's incredibly hard then to get out that public health information um, that's so vital at this point. The last thing that people think about is, I think, you know, in a situation like Cox's Bazaar, right, where basically you have Rohingya refugees being hosted in Bangladesh, right? The worry is if um, the virus breaks out in a refugee camp like that, how is that going to impact kind of relationships with Bangladesh and host communities and kind of the perception? Another little piece that's interesting is I'm on a, a board of a of an NGO. Um, it's a girls empowerment NGO in Myanmar. And yesterday I got an email um, from the director kind of already starting to lay out what the concerns are there, right? They've had to shut down their girls empowerment programming. They've had to shut down program for um, young women working in factories. And what they're really concerned about is that the last time we've seen these kinds of shutdowns, right? A lot of girls are going to be impacted by an uptick in violence, exploitation, trafficking, lack of access to critical reproductive health services. You know, we know this from the school closures in Ebola in 2014. We had major spikes in child labor, neglect, um, you know, sexual and physical abuse, teenage pregnancies. And so, you know, it's this kind of, there's all these secondary things I kind of laid out for you in the beginning, kind of some of the immediate needs, but we know that we're going to see um, a lot more. And I could go on and on, right? Yemen, we have 24 28 million people affected Burkina Faso. So there's a lot of these kind of trends, both in immediate life saving and longer term that are challenging. Great, thank you. Um, another question that's come in from um, Anya on Facebook. Anya says, how will a coronavirus outbreak impact aid workers who try to go into these camps? And Anya says, thank you. Thanks, Anya. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that right now there's kind of a few things happening. One is a lot of aid workers are actually also, you know, grounded or um, quarantined and are basically their movements have really been um, um, held back, right, in terms of the international aid system. You know, in aid, it's always thought a lot that it's really international aid workers that are doing it, but, you know, it's a national and local response. That's kind of the largest humanitarian response. And so in some ways, I think, the aid community is hoping that this is a chance to strengthen our partnerships with local and national organizations and find ways that we can support them remotely. Um, but there are so all really very real concerns of aid workers getting sick, just the same things that you're hearing on the news about doctors and nurses, right? Aid workers have all of those same challenges, but are in much less resourced environments for the most part. So getting PPEs, right? All those things are hard. Another big issue is, you know, aid workers maybe not being seen as essential services and not being able to cross critical borders or get to critical places that they need to. And this is even before COVID, right? So, you know, in those crisis situations, there's life-saving assistance that's happening now. And so these disruptions are also already disrupting um, the ability to help a lot of people. I mean, COVID in some of these places is maybe priority four or five in terms of what's actually um, affecting morbidity and mortality now at this point. Thank you. Um, so we got a question about planning earlier and um, a lot of the work that you've done um, in your career, you've helped to implement uh, plans around crises situations. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about how you view preparedness and planning and especially right now where we're already in the thick of this crisis, how can people continue to plan ahead? 
Yeah. So in terms of aid workers or in terms of individuals or all of it? I think all. Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, let me start with it with aid workers. So, you know, there is kind of been luckily or not luckily, um, I think the aid system in general is pretty has a lot of skills and kind of doing contingency planning preparedness um, activities. Now, unfortunately, the trend is always the same that preparedness gets funded a lot less than response does. And that's, you know, problematic for many reasons. But one is that we know, um, you know, preparedness is a lot more inexpensive, right? It costs a lot less than response does. I mean, there's figures of a one to six um, ratio in terms of dollars, right? One dollar on preparedness saves you six or seven dollars in response. But I've seen that figure um, vary, but it's always kind of exponentially different. And so that's kind of the, the, the first thing, even if I think the aid system has the capacity to do this, it's, it's easy to get money, right, after Hurricane Dorian, it's really hard to get money to support um, the government in advance to prepare for, you know, to prepare for that hurricane. So that's kind of one thing. But um, in terms of preparedness, yeah, I think one thing that we're as maybe another bright spot is uh, the UN last week launched um, a humanitarian response plan um, for COVID and humanitarian crises. And it came Came out kind of you know very quick and it, and it covers all kinds of strategic priorities it has specific plans for a lot of the different crisis contexts you know and there's so many wonderful things in that plan they're including mental health and psychosocial support they're looking at these issues that i was talking about with refugee camps and how do we make sure all the people on the move right still are protected um, they're looking at increasing hand washing facilities so a lot of those kind of areas i gave you in the beginning the humanitarian system is now trying to think about how they can how they can do that. The challenge is that that appeals for $2 billion. And the question is, can we get $2 billion um, now to do this work? And I think the hope is that, you know, if um, I think the hope is that if if we can come up with a $2 trillion package, right, can we also come up with some money at $2 billion? So that's going to save a lot of lives, right? Because if this virus continues to circle around the globe, that's going to impact all of us as well. Great, thank you. Um, so we now have a question from two of your uh, former students, Janie Hamaker and Maeve Curtin. Oh, great. Uh -oh. So, uh, they say, hi, Professor Gelsdorf. Hearing you talk about malnutrition in Cox's Bazaar is making me think about India where lockdown measures have rendered millions of migrants homeless and hungry and social safety net programs like rations being interrupted. How are people in the humanitarian action field considering the trade-offs between these secondary impacts like food insecurity and the lockdown and social distancing measures intended to slow the spread of COVID-19? Yeah, thanks, Janie um, and Maeve. I, you know, I think that's it, right? It's I called it secondary, um, you know, wave of issues, and those are really at the forefront of the humanitarian system's mind. So, if you look at that, for example, that humanitarian response appeal, the whole st second strategic objective is about this area, right? Is trying to think about kind of the situation you just highlighted, or the one that I highlighted, um, you know, about the situation in Myanmar with the NGO that I work with, right? Is that we know that there's gonna be so many other things that cause a rise in morbidity and mortality and stress and violence for so many communities. And so, you know, the humanitarian system, I think is, is trying to think about what, you know, how, how we assist those in different ways, right? How we think impartially, how do we address, um, you know, the need that's needed the most um, immediately, but that is, that's, that's really challenging to do. And I think, you know, every context is going to have a very different reality, not only in terms of what the situation is and vulnerability and how COVID, um, you know, how COVID hits there, but also kind of what governments allow the international system to do, right, and where we're allowed to respond, and how do we respond with different national policies, creating different kind of situations of, of quarantine. So I think this is, this is a major issue of, of concern, right? And kind of what I mentioned too, I think, you know, urban areas are, are really, we're really starting to think about and really worried about kind of, you know, the millions and millions or billions of people that are trapped in these kind of spontaneous settlements and slum-like areas. Great, thank you. Um, well, another question from Facebook user Enrique says, hi, Professor Gelsdorf, thank you. I was wondering if you had any ideas, predictions about how border shutdowns from COVID have affected displaced peoples and refugees fleeing their home countries. Do you know how large refugees 
how large refugee receiving countries are responding to the crisis? Yeah, so I haven't looked at all of the specifics for the latest policies. Everything's kind of changing on a daily basis. I mean, we know globally that there's around 70 million displaced people, right? But that includes not only refugees, right? Which is actually a smaller proportion of that number, but a lot of it is internally displaced people, right? So people who are displaced because of crisis, conflict, disaster, but don't actually cross a border. So the issue that you're highlighting is actually one that we need to think about both within borders and in terms of crossing borders. And you know, quarantine policies in some way create new borders, right, for populations and how that's and and you know, and who's going to get assistance when and in what areas. And people who are displaced have higher degrees of marginalization or the ability to access healthcare, food, right? There's a lot of a lot of those issues. So, um, you know, right now we're already seeing kind of the closing of borders causing um, concern and issues ar around displacement. And that's why that humanitarian appeal is also, that's its, its third strategic objective is just to look specifically at the needs of refugees and IDPs and everything from advocating and trying to talk to different governments about asylum seekers and, and those policies to trying to support the camps that um, are in their countries, right, especially in these large refugee hosting countries like Turkey and Lebanon. So, you know, it's individually each of each of these places is going to face these different challenges. Um, one more question from um, audience member Angelina on Facebook. Has aid toward communities caught in civil war, such as Syria, changed or increased due to COVID-19? You know, so we're still, we haven't, we haven't really seen, there's two major concerns, I think, and I love the underlying premise of your question is a really important one, which is, you know, kind of what I was saying, it's like, yes, we, the humanitarian system needs this, this, this $2 billion for COVID response, but it also continues to need the additional, the, the funding that it set out at the beginning of the year for all of these humanitarian situations. You know, and even before COVID, some of these appeals, like the ones for Yemen, you know, where I said 24 of 20 million people in that country, 24 of 28 million are relying on humanitarian aid. Well, the funding that the international system has received is under 10%, right? 10% of the estimated need in terms of that. So we do think that there are gonna be concerns um, financially in terms of funding um, humanitarian crisis, both originally what we know, the additional needs coming from COVID, and then maybe also just you know the changing paths of funding that's needed and, and how that's gonna happen. And Syria definitely will be, Syria and all the surrounding countries will definitely be part of that equation. The hope is this though, is that I think some of us who are hopeful is, you know, it, if you think about it, two billion indifferent to two trillion, right? It's it's not a lot of money when you compare it to those two, and yet the impact it can have is so massive, right? And generally, people are really generous when it comes to you know humanitarian need in some shape or form, and so we're we're hoping that that is kind of the trend that continues. Great. Uh, we have another question from Tori on Facebook. She says, thank you. Um, COVID-19 asks us to come together by physically isolating, separating from one another. Do you have any recommendations for individuals sitting at home who want to provide help in these crises scenarios? Is there a way to galvanize support or consolidate funding to have a meaningful wave of impact? Yeah, hi, Tori. Um... So I think that's a great question, right? And I think, yeah, I mean, I think a couple of things, right? Just all of you turning up for this, right? That's a start on on what we're on what we're seeing, right? Caring about these issues, caring about the issues. You know, there are, there are of course incredible needs within your own communities, maybe within your own households, as well. But you know, what I'm hoping is that we have kind of this path of compassion that and action that can happen simultaneously on many levels um, and in many different ways. So, you know, a couple of things. One is, you know, I recently uh, heard COVID also referred to as an infodemic, right? So it's not just, a, you know, basically a pandemic, but also the idea that, you know, information is being used as a weapon in some of these instances, right? So everything from like, you know, xenophobic remarks and racist remarks that happen around it to misinformation um, about treatment to like I was talking about within Bangladesh, right? Not refugees not having access to internet and mobile connections 
connections that they need. And so I think for some of us, I think some one, one thing is kind of, you know, looking out where the information um, is misleading and trying to think about how can you contribute um, kind of, you know, to a positive information cycle in this crisis. You know, the second thing is, is, you know, pro-social behavior. So for those who are able, um, you know, to donate, I think that, you know, this is a time to also think about those international needs or, you know, lobbying your different um, congressmen about being able to support this. I mean, I know that there is some kind of some different, um, we're lucky in that there's kind of some charitable deduction liberalization happening right now that the government has put in place. And the other thing that I would say is, to kind of take the long run approach, right? Not just think about what's happening right now. The impacts from COVID in these humanitarian situations is gonna last for a really long period of time. So, you know, how can you kind of sustain your empathy and compassion in ways to kind of address these issues in the longer run? Great, and I think we have time for one more question. This is coming from um, our Facebook user, Matt. He says, hello. Um, Matt is wondering, what are things that you have learned in your career that give you hope and optimism in this situation? Yeah. I mean, I think, like I said before, right, the idea that all these people came out yesterday and came out today, right, for this talk, right, the fact that I have, you know, these former students, um, that IRC graphic I showed you was just sent to me by a student. There isn't a day that hasn't gone by that students haven't sent me different information about this crisis, which shows me that people are engaged um, in these issues, which we have to be, because like I said, we have to push back against where the media coverage is only addressing something that's happening now. Um, and, you know, I think, like I mentioned before, there's all these great community engagements, right? So I heard about book lending libraries now becoming pantries in different places. And so it's that kind of a spirit, like what can we do um, to support each other, right? Most many communities have resettled refugees, have marginalized populations. You know, how are we making sure that their needs are being met at this time? The other thing that I guess I would say is, you know, Innovation is really um, is kind of a core part of humanitarian aid. So I think what a lot of the world is facing right now in terms of trying to figure out how to solve solutions, this is kind of a re daily reality in the humanitarian space. And so there's really incredible things happening. So the NGO in Myanmar that I mentioned, for example, they've now started kind of a girls crisis hotline, right? So that girls can call in and so that these girls who are being cut off from the programming that is so vital from, for them still have a way to connect. There are surveillance activities that they're doing as well to see how you know they can support figuring out um, how to support individuals. Um, you know, there are different things happening like UNICEF working with education ministries to see like, how do we identify alternative ways of learning. Well, I think many of us in the US are learning a lot about homeschooling right now, learning over, you know, technology. Can some of these things now also, you know, happen within the humanitarian system? Um, you know, optimism is I'm already seeing the humanitarian community thinking really carefully about, you know, how do we do community engagement? How do we make sure this isn't just a top down solution? How do we not just do kind of international assistance? And I guess the last thing I would say about that is, um, I hope, and this is kind of kind of said different, but that we can learn uh, something from this whole crisis, which is that it really does take a global approach, right? That this crisis is going to impact everybody everywhere, and that we, as a individual societies and communities, but kind of as a global community, need to really find ways now to seriously come together and think about how we confront some of these challenges together. Because it's not just COVID nineteen, right? It's climate. It's going to be cybersecurity. There are a lot of you know we knew a pandemic like this was really possible, and so what I hope is that, what gives me optimism is that maybe we will kind of learn some of these lessons, um, make some of the hard reforms that are gonna be necessary when this is over that can actually prepare us, bring us together, really look out for vulnerable populations moving ahead. Wonderful, well, thank you so much for joining us, Professor Gelsdorf, and for your really powerful, impactful work that you've been doing in this field. We're so lucky to have you at Batten and UVA. Um, and if, any users on Facebook uh, viewing this have additional questions, please feel free to keep them coming in the comments and we can work to get those to Professor Gelsdorf, unfortunately. We are out of time today, but um, we'd love to keep this conversation going. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I, I was, and thank you all for coming and asking these great questions.